Hi, my name is Trey Waterhouse with Atlas Copco. In this video, I'm going to present and demonstrate fastening theory using our operator guidance software, SQS. Now the SQS guidance software is going to walk me through the presentation and provide instructions and control the tool for the demo. You'll see these little circles throughout the video. These indicate that there is a tightening operation to be performed in that work step. Once completed, the guidance will automatically move on to the next step. We're going to use this to advance the screen throughout the video using a simple rotate tightening program. When the circle is blue, that is the active tightening process to be completed. I'll pull the trigger, the tool performs the tightening, and then the guidance advances to the next work step. Just like this. Here's a look at the general topics we're going to cover. Why it's important to understand fastening theory. What is torque and clamp load and how they're related. What kinds of things can influence clamp load and how we can use this knowledge of fastening theory to error-proof the assembly process. So we're going to be digging into the science of the threaded fastener. Our purpose in doing so is to be able to ultimately answer these two questions. What is right, and how do we control that? To do this, we're going to use a combination of theoretical concepts and physical demonstration using our battery assembly tool, our patented Benford bolt test joint, and our SQS operator guidance software. To start with, let's review the function of a threaded fastener. For purposes of this demonstration, we're going to be talking about a threaded fastener whose function is to clamp two components together by acting as a heavy spring. This clamp force needs to be high enough to withstand any external forces on the components so that the joint remains stable and the components stay together. Now we can't talk about the science of threaded fasteners without talking about torque. Torque is simply the result of applying a known force at a known distance from a point of rotation. This is also commonly referred to as force at a distance, and common units for this are newton meters or foot pounds. This torque is used to rotate our threaded fastener until we achieve the desired clamp load for the joint. So if clamp force is our ultimate goal for the joint, why do we measure the torque? The simple answer is that clamp load is too expensive to measure in a typical production environment. Torque is significantly less expensive to measure, and since there exists a known relationship between torque and clamp force, it allows us to approximate clamp load based on the achieved torque of the joint. We break the tightening process down into four phases. The first is called rundown. This is the part of the tightening where we're just taking up all the extra threads in the bolt before the bolt head or nut make any contact with the part. This is generally really low torque. The second phase is called drawdown. This is where we first start to contact the part and begin to pull the parts together. Think of this as a phase where we're just squeezing all the air out of the joint. The third phase is called the elastic phase. It starts once all the air gaps are squeezed out and we have true line-to-line -line contact with the mating parts. In this phase, the bolt is actually being stretched, which creates the clamp load in the joint. In this phase, the bolt stretch stays within the elastic range of the bolt, which just means that if the bolt is loosened, it will return to its original length. The fourth phase is called the plastic phase. We only get to this phase if the bolt is stretched beyond its elastic limit. In this phase, the bolt is stretched so far that it is permanently deformed, and if loosened, it will not return to its original length. It's fairly uncommon for threaded fasteners to get to the plastic phase, and unless it's designed for the joint intentionally, it will usually result in the joint failure. So let's take a closer look at that relationship between torque and clamp load. This formula shows us the relationship between torque, clamp load, and friction. Don't worry, you absolutely don't need to know this formula. We're just using this to demonstrate that there's more going on here than just torque and clamp load. When you apply torque to a bolt, some of that torque goes to stretching the bolt and creating clamp load, but some of it's lost to friction. What we can see here with this formula is that for a typical average fastener, only about 10% of the torque applied to the bolt actually creates clamp load. The other 90% is lost to friction between the male and female threads and the face of the nut or bolt. This can cause some serious variation in clamp load if these friction factors change at all. Let's look at a couple real demonstrations of this. So to demonstrate this, we're going to use our Benford bolt test joint. For our first tightening, we're going to install a steel washer and tighten the bolt to 0.15 newton meters. So we put the steel washer on, hand start the nut. SQS has sent the program to the tool, and we're ready to tighten. Now the tool shot off at 0.17 newton meters. 
and we generated just under five newtons of clamp load. Now we're gonna loosen this one up. And next we're gonna install a rubber washer which is gonna increase our friction. Once again, SQS has sent the same program to the tool and we're ready to tighten. This time the tool shut off at 0.18 newton meters and we generated just under two newtons of clamp load. We're gonna loosen this one up. And last, we're gonna use the rubber washer that's been lubricated. So the tool shut off at 0.17 newton meters, but you can see we generated six newtons of clamp force. So we demonstrated that with the rubber washer, our generated clamp load was less than half than when we used the steel washer. And with the lubricant, it was almost 50% more. So with this demonstration, we've shown just how much variation in clamp load can be caused by changes in various frictional factors. So next, let's take a look at the breakdown of where that torque is going in each of the three previous examples. For each demonstration, we use the same tightening program with the same target torque. The steel washer is our baseline, and we see a pretty typical contribution of torque to creating clamp load. With the rubber washer, we increased friction under the head of the nut, and we saw a dramatic reduction in clamp load. With the lubricated washer, we reduced the friction under the head of the nut, and we saw a dramatic increase in clamp load. The key here is that using torque alone as our means of assuring clamp load leaves us subject to major variations in actual clamp load generated. So what can we do about that? We know creating clamp load is the ultimate purpose of the threaded fastener. We know there is a relationship between torque and clamp load, but now we've shown there is also a major risk in using torque alone to approximate actual generated clamp load. So what else could we measure that could be used to give us a better approximation of generated clamp load? The answer to that question is angle of rotation. What we're going to show in the next step is how angle of rotation and torque can be used together to give us a significantly better assurance of actual generated clamp load. What we have here is called the torque and angle trace. As we tighten the bolt, we measure both torque and angle and graph them on the X and Y axis, and the result is a curve that is unique to that specific joint geometry. If any of the components of the joint change, like using incorrect parts, or if any frictional changes occur, like we saw in our previous demonstration, the shape of this curve will change. A tool that can be programmed to monitor torque versus angle can then provide us with okay or not okay feedback to give us a very high confidence that our desired clamp load was achieved. If you recall, clamp load is generated during phase three or after our parts are all pulled together or what we call the snug point. Any bolt rotation after this point is creating bolt stretch and therefore clamp load. One of the most common air proofing methods is to monitor this bolt rotation after the snug point and require the angle to be between an upper and lower limit, just like we require for torque. This creates an okay window that is a small square where both torque and angle requirements have been met. Most joint geometry changes like incorrect parts or frictional changes that would affect clamp load will result in the curve not landing in that required square, which will yield the not okay result and require that joint to be reworked to correct the issue. That combined use of torque and angle to give a defined okay range on the torque and angle trace is the basis for what we call error proofing. Next, we're gonna talk about joint rate, which is determined by how many degrees of rotation after our snug point are needed to achieve our target torque. A hard joint is one that takes 45 degrees or less. A soft joint takes 360 degrees or more, and in between is kind of a gray area of medium hard and medium soft joints. Joint rate is really important in sizing tools for an application, as a soft joint takes significantly more energy to tighten than a hard joint of equal torque. It will also be used in error proofing the assembly, which we'll demonstrate in a little bit. In this step, we're going to demonstrate tightening a bolt on a hard joint. I'm gonna use this quarter 20 hex bolt and a steel flat washer and tighten them down into the first hole. You can see in the torque and angle trace, my rundown is nice and flat, and I have just a few degrees of angle between snug point and our target torque. 
Next, we're gonna demonstrate tightening a bolt on a soft joint. I'm gonna use the same quarter 20 hex bolt, but this time I'm gonna use a soft rubber washer and I'm gonna tighten it down into the fourth hole. You can see in the torque and angle trace, I reached a snug point and then the slope of the curve is a little flatter with a few hundred degrees of rotation in phase three between snug and final torque. Now we're going to show how we can use these concepts of fastening theory in a programmable assembly tool like this Tensor ICB to detect assembly mistakes like wrong or missing components or changes in friction that will affect our desired clamp load. For this demo, I'm going to intentionally make a few mistakes and we'll show how the tool delivers a not okay result until I correct those mistakes. So the instructions are telling me to tighten the quarter 20 hex bolt and rubber washer into the last hole in the demo block. Instead, I'm going to use a steel washer and install it in the wrong hole. You can see the tool shows red and gives me a not okay result, which is also displayed on my bolt in SQS. As an operator, I look at this and realize I tightened this in the wrong location, so I back it out and move it to the correct spot. And once again, I get a not okay result. I inspect the joint and realize I've got the wrong washer, so I'll need to rework this again. This time I get an okay and my work step is complete. So we just demonstrated how a programmable tool can detect and report an assembly error, giving the operator the chance to fix it in station rather than down the line or worse in the field. Okay, the next topic we're gonna to cover is something called prevailing torque. This is the existence of higher than usual torque during the rundown phase. This can be intentional in applications like thread cutting screws or lock nuts. It can also be unintentional in cases like thread contamination or damage, or hole misalignment. The important thing is to know whether you expect there to be any prevailing torque or not and account for that in your tightening program. To demonstrate this, we're just gonna tighten a lock nut onto a stud. Start my nut, and then run this down with the tool. Now if we look at the torque and angle trace, we can see we have about 0.25 to 0.35 newton meters of torque during the rundown, which is about 25 to 30% higher than we had before when we were using the non-lock nut. So we'd wanna make sure that we account for that in our tightening program to achieve the desired clamp load. The last topic we're gonna to cover is joint relaxation. This is a reduction in clamp force that happens after we've completed the tightening. In many applications, it happens really quickly, like within the first few milliseconds after the torque is removed. In other applications, it might take up to a few minutes. The severity and duration of the relaxation depend greatly on the geometry of the joint. In the next step, we'll demonstrate a really exaggerated example where you can see the relaxation as it's happening using the Benford bolt. Okay, for this demo, we're gonna use a viscoelastic liquid silicone polymer, also called Silly Putty. We're gonna form this into a round washer and then tighten it down on the Benford bolt. So first I'm gonna roll this out, make it into a round washer, and then we're gonna sandwich this between two steel washers. And then we're gonna tighten down on this and see what happens. Now watch the force gauge now that we've removed the torque. You can see the needle is dropping as the joint relaxes. This is obviously an exaggerated case, but it's essentially the same thing that's happening in most bolted joints. The key here is to understand that it's happening, how much you expect it to relax, and then account for that in your tightening strategy. And with that, our job is complete. Hopefully you learned a few things about fastening theory and how assembly tools and software can provide error proofing for your assembly processes. 
If you have any questions about this or any other assembly related topics, please reach out to your Atlas Calco sales rep. Thanks for watching.